Good morning, everybody. This is Mike Johnson with Data Recognition Corporation. I'm the National Director for the TAPE Test. And we'll get started here in just a second. Dr. Wilkinson, I didn't know if you wanted to open anything up. No, Mike, it's completely whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. So we'll go ahead and get started today. And uh, I think most people are putting their information into the chat for the attendance but you can also use the chat to put any questions that you might have as we go through the presentation. And I'll stop periodically to try to review those questions. The training today is for table 11 and 12, and I've uh, primarily focused on the online environment for the training and also trying to mix between introduction and uh, more experienced people that are using TAPE online. So I think we have a mix of uh, new and experienced people today. So um, I'll try to touch on different areas, but certainly if you do have a question as we're going through it, you can uh, always put that in the chat. If you have something that you've used as a, as a better tip or trick than what I'm describing, I'm certainly open to hearing that and sharing that with the group as we go forward. So getting started, uh, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll do a brief review of table 11 and 12 as an assessment to get started and then we'll spend much of the time in the actual TABE portal going through the, the online system. We'll then also discuss some of the reports at the end. We'll touch on remote proctoring if anybody needs some information related to remote testing and then touch on a little bit of the research and some su support materials at the end of the presentation. Where we're at today, uh, we have Tape 11 and 12, and we have Tape Class E. Those are the two assessments that are federally approved from, from DRC. Tape 11 and 12 is obviously for the adult ed students, Tape Class E for the adult ESL students. Uh, both are available in paper or computer format. So as we're going through the presentation today, uh, we're, we're talking more about Tape Class E tomorrow. So I'll, I'll probably save most of those references for tomorrow's webinar but uh, a lot of the online features are the same uh, in within 11 and 12 and tape class D. From a standpoint of where we are in the life cycle of the assessments, both assessments are nearing the end of their current federal approval. That always doesn't mean that there's a hard end because the Department of Education normally does some sort of extensions um, to allow states and programs transitional time. So I'm not gonna really speak about when they will go away, just to know that we are starting development on TABE 13 and 14, just from a, a, a foundational perspective. And uh, again, if you have any comments about what you like or what you don't like in TABE 11 and 12 that you would like to discuss um, or put in the chat, we certainly are open to that type of feedback as well. Same thing with Tape Class E. Tape Class E is going through a refresh. Um, both assessments are being updated from the questions perspective. We don't see a big change in the standards for either one. So for those people that went through the transition from 9, 10 to 11 and 12, uh, we don't see any big changes like that happening in the future, just more about updating the questions on the test. Now, as we go into 13 and 14, we we might see some readjustment of some of the questions, things that were on one level might move to a different level to better uh, address the kind of the normative state of instruction across the country. But we'll also see um, our plan is to move to our adaptive testing for the online testing. So uh, you'll start to hear more and more about adaptive testing for TABE in the future because that would allow us to be a little bit more efficient in computer-based testing without a locator, without the different levels of TABE, EM, DNA, and without having to worry about alternate forms that, that the, the adaptive engine would control kind of the randomization of the, of the exposure to the student. So we'll see more and more of that as in, the, in the next year or two as we go forward with that development. But just to know that we are working on uh, the foundations of updates for both assessments. So where we're at today, we're with Table 11 and 12. Um, the current levels, the uh, EM, DNA, are the levels that are available within Table Online. We do still publish a level L, which is the literacy level. 
for programs that do offer low literacy services to students, level L could be an option. It is paper-based currently because students do write directly in the test booklet. But again, these are the students that are very low literacy, uh, students that are probably functioning below the first or kindergarten level from a literacy perspective. And, uh, and TABE level L certainly can measure that uh, performance. TABE did start out back in 1967 with versions one and two. So we always have two versions, uh, alternate forms so that you can do pre and post testing. As we mentioned, uh, the subject areas right now, reading, math, and language, we have added a writing test, and we'll discuss that a little bit today. Writing is still going through the federal approval, so it's not used for NRS reporting, but we do have a writing test that's built into the online system. And then, as I mentioned, the, the standards, the National College and Career Readiness Standards from the Department of Education, those are not changing uh, as we move forward. So the high school equivalency test aligned to that, and and we also align to that with TABE as well. Where TABE is used, it's used in many different types of programs. The, the main use and the one that you guys are most familiar with is the, the WIOA funded adult education programs up in the top left corner. But TABE is also used in correctional programs and it's used in correctional programs sometimes as part of the WIOA funded program. So those two circles on the left side sometimes merge but also in corrections, they may use it for uh, other educational purposes outside of the WIOA adult ed program. They may use it for uh, purposes of intake into technical programs. Uh, some states use it as a reduced sentencing mechanism. I know in Indiana, if you get a certain score on TABE, you do get six months off your sentence. If you get your high school equivalency, then you get another six months off your sentence. So different states have different uses of TABE within the correctional setting. There are several college programs that use TABE uh, for placement purposes. This is not for acceptance into the post-secondary, but more of a placement category. Uh, many programs use AccuPlacer and some programs use TABE in, in place of that to say, should this student be going into the four credit or the non-credit remedial track for some of the reading and math skills as they're entering into the post-secondary world. So that's another use. And over on the bottom right-hand side, high school equivalency uh, alternatives. This was a little bit more of an initiative before the COVID pandemic, but there were a couple of states that were starting some pilots to say, if TABE is aligning the college and career readiness standards and the high school equivalency are, tests are aligned to the same standards, is there some overlap that potentially could be efficient in allowing a TABE reading or math test to be accepted for high school equivalency. This is a state question and a state initiative. So these pilot programs that were started in North Carolina, I'm sorry, South Carolina and New York kind of slowed down during the pandemic, but I think they're interested in starting that back up. It's just as a way to not over test a student or to use test in several different ways. So if you can use a TAPE test for WIOA reporting, but also for uh, high school equivalency credentialing, uh, because it's aligning to the same standards and the scores have been gone through a research alignment and concordance, then that might be a way to shorten the pathway for students in adult education. We'll also talk about a little bit later in the presentation, our new workforce portal that addresses the top right corner, the workforce screening and in area. A lot of companies have used TABE and continue to use TABE for play, workforce screening. Um, I know the um, Nebraska State Patrol and Oklahoma State Patrol and Florida Sheriff's Department use TABE as an entrance requirement into their police academies or into the hiring process. There are companies like the Jim Beam Distillery in Kentucky or the Dow Chemical Factories in South Carolina that use TABE as a hiring tool into several positions. A lot of those companies work with local colleges or local providers, local, local workforce centers to assess potential employees. So they're not directly TABE customers, but they are using TABE in a workforce setting. We're working on a new workforce portal that will be launching later this fall. And I'll have some slides on that a little bit later in the presentation that will address uh, aligning TABE reading and math scores 
to the reading and math requirements to over 700 of the top jobs from the U.S. Department of Labor so that students that are interested in some of the top jobs uh, will now have detailed research on what the reading and math requirements are to be successful in those areas. A quick question that popped up is, uh, is there a, a comparison or concordance between TABE and ACCUPLACER? And there's not right now. It's, it's one that we would love to create. We'll see a little bit later that we do have a concordance between TABE and the high school equivalency test. And the way that that happens is that we have to find data to support that. So we had um, several states that had students take TABE and take the high school equivalency test. We need to, to find that same data for AccuPlacer or even work keys is another request that we get quite often. So looking at where we can find that data. And we have found some. There, there are some programs that keep that data in a central repository, but a lot of times the AccuPlacer data might be in a college database where the TAID data is in an adult ed database and, and they the two do not necessarily mix. So it's sometimes hard to find that concorded data. But it is something that we're actively uh, always looking for more data for that. From a beginning standpoint and a pathway standpoint, um, a typical, and I won't say always the, the case, but a typical adult ed student would come into a program on the top left corner. They would then take a locator test to be placed into a paid pretest. That pretest might be 11 or 12, depending on what that program decides to use for their pretest. And then that student gets entered into an instructional program. After a period of time that in that instructional program, that student would take a post test, sometimes called a progress test, to see if they've made a measurable skills gain for NRS reporting. They may make a, a measurable skills gain, but they may still not be ready for exit. So they may go back into an, another instructional track at a higher level. But eventually, at some point, the student, uh, the goal is to have them in the bottom right corner that they're ready to exit adult education and ready to exit to somewhere else to be successful. And this has always been the, the kind of the challenge of what is exiting and what is uh, what's the next step. Uh, a lot of students, the majority of students that come into adult education would love to get their high school equivalency and, and, and see that as the great accomplishment and the, and the end point. But traditionally, that is a, a step in the process, not necessarily always the end point. And I know that that's the difference between the program's goal of preparing a student for success and the student wanting to get their high school equivalency and get out of the program as quick as possible. So certainly it's a, it's a tough retention challenge that many programs go through. The goal of the U.S. Department of Education when they created the new college and career readiness standards several years ago was to prepare a student to succeed after adult education. And so that's why we saw those standards become much more rigorous and the goal was to have a student stay in adult education as long as possible to then be well prepared for the next step. And usually that next step is a high school equivalency test, but being ready to succeed is not getting the minimum passing score on that high school equivalency test. So it's, uh, you know, having retention in adult education so that a student can maybe get to the college ready score on the high school equivalency test so that they are better prepared to succeed when they go into a post-secondary program or looking for a job directly out of adult education so that they can be successful and have a job that provides a sustainable wage uh, for that student or for that family. So again, we, we don't necessarily see that high school equivalency at the end point. Uh, and we'll look at the research a little bit later that shows you know students could be ready to pass at a minimum threshold uh, in the middle of the adult education pathway, but are they ready to succeed um, after adult debt? And, and what the Department of Education was trying to avoid was a student going into adult education, going through that and getting their high school equivalency and then exiting, and then maybe going into post-secondary, having to take a test like AccuPlacer for placement and being placed in a remedial program that is non-credit bearing, but still does cost financial aid money. So 
that student would likely have to use their Pell Grant to pay for the tuition, but they're not seeing the credit towards graduation from that remedial class. And so at the end of the pathway, now the student is maybe running out of financial aid money and still does not have enough credit to graduate. If they would have stayed in adult education and uh, continued with the instruction there so that they're better prepared for the high school equivalency test to pass at a higher level, then they go into post-secondary and go directly into the credit-bearing programs. And, and that was the goal. And I'll, I'll say that I know that's the, the goal versus reality is always a tough decision or tough, tough circumstance. But that was the goal is that if a student could be retained in adult education long enough, they then would be better prepared to succeed. And, and somewhere along that pathway could be a high school equivalency, but it doesn't have to be the end point. It could be one of the process stepping stones in, in the middle, uh, essentially. So um, just kind of pointing out why things changed with college and career readiness, and it was based on the Department of Education and the, the administration at that time wanting to have students to succeed going forward. Kind of to support that um, example, we saw the NRS descriptors change. Descriptor for tape uh, for NRS level one. And I think my, I just lost my microphone, so I'm switching to that real quick. But level one in the top left corner is what tape nine and 10 used to align to. In the white area of the screen is what we see is the new descriptor for the new college and career readiness standards from the Department of Education. These standards are much more rigorous and much more detailed. This is still all level one math. So technically what we, is covered by level E of TABE, but we see the highlighted yellow areas that I have um, being much more uh, detailed, and apply your knowledge, explain your reasoning, understand and apply, strategically select. So a lot more information of an expected student at that lower level still as we see this is level one of math. Looking at reading at level five, again, the old TABE 9 and 10 descriptor that we were following was very short, one sentence. The new descriptor that we need to follow for TABE 11 and 12 is much more advanced. And we, we saw this across all the NRS descriptors. And this is also where the separation of high school equivalency and TABE uh, comes into. High school equivalency tests align to the college and career readiness standards. And TABE does that as well. But TABE also has to align to the federal NRS descriptors. So the six levels for reading, the six levels for math, and six levels for language. That's these levels that became, they turned in from one sentence to, to several paragraphs. The high school equivalency tests do not have to align to these descriptors because they don't receive federal approval for reporting purposes. So that's where we see sometimes programs will say, why is TABE level D or level A more rigorous than the, the GED test? And it's because going back to that uh, previous discussion about success and and there are secondary and, and third level passing scores for the GED. You have the, the career ready and then the college credit cut scores. And to address those levels and to address the, the goal of the Department of Ed for success, we have more rigorous levels of TABE for that as well. From an objective area for TABE 11 and 12, a couple of quick points just to see on a graphical sense. Math, fairly straightforward that you see some beginning math skills, some intermediate math skills, and some advanced math skills. But then in reading and language, we see the dots covering all levels of TABE. And I'll use key ideas and details as the example. Key ideas and details is discussed on every level of TABE as an objective area. But how we address that, what types of questions are being used, the length of the reading passages and the detail of the reading passages that are used. In Table 11 and 12, the, re the passages and the questions are all written towards the standards. 
In tape nine and 10, a lot of the questions were pulled from the public domain. So we saw a screenplay from Neil Simon, for example, and there'd be some questions about that. Now, most of the reading passages for tape 11 and 12 are written by DRC item writing teams so that they are addressing the standards and then the question is also addressing the standards. So we're, we're, we're really targeting in on the skills that are being measured both with the passage and the question. Real quick, just as an overview of, of where we're at with the content, um, I think a lot of people have seen this that are using Table 11 and 12, much more of a focus in reading on reading for information and versus that previous focus on literary text. So, you know, again, as I mentioned, the, the authored pieces, the screenplays and the poems and things, you see less of that with Table 11 and 12, but more focus on reading for information. Same thing with math and, and much more of a focus on uh, applied skills. Not that computation isn't covered on the test, it is, but in, in the past it was a separate assessment. And now it's one math test that is uh, focused on a lot of applied skills and bringing in those computation skills as well. And then on language, the one area, the big area that for programs that do use the language test is that now we see the inclusion of some of the mechanics and spelling and, and grammar skills where those used to be separate parts of TABE because they weren't part of the federal approval process. Now under the new college and career readiness standards, they become part of the NRS. And so we see more of an inclusion of some of those uh, additional language skills covered on the main part of the test for the language portion. And as I mentioned, the writing test, it is available in, in the online platform. It does include 15 multiple choice questions and an essay at the end. The essay is scored locally um, by local staff with, with a rubric that's provided. We were doing a research project for the last six months or so that DRC staff was scoring that writing sample. Same thing with tape class E. That has ended, but we've had a lot of programs asked to bring that back. So we are working on bringing that back. Uh, it would be something that would be paid for and it would not be uh, a free service as it was as part of the research project, but some programs that are using either tape writing or class E writing and speaking uh, might uh, need to have the scoring services. And, and we are working to try to bring that back as a, as a product available for tape support. One of the great resources that are available, and I'll jump over to our website to show where these are, are the blueprints for each of the TABE test content areas. The blueprints allow teachers, curriculum managers, or instructional design people to work on understanding what's covered within the TABE test specifically. So here we see a level D reading blueprint. Very quickly, I can see that level D addresses three areas of the College and Career Readiness Standards, key ideas and details, craft and structure, integration of knowledge and ideas, and key ideas and details is almost half the test. So if I'm preparing the curriculum plan or lesson plans for uh, my upper level reading programs, I, I understand that, you know, half the test is measuring key ideas and details. These Pi sections on the blueprints are also broken out down below in the shaded areas, the color corresponding areas. And now we see the sub skills that are being addressed within that 47% of key ideas and details. And what we see on the far right hand side is a couple of high emphasis areas, a couple of medium emphasis areas, and then, and then a few low emphasis. That relates to how many questions are being used within that 47%. So certainly looking at, you know, cite several pieces of contextual evidence to support analysis of what the text says explicitly, that is a high emphasis uh, for level D of TABE. We might see that same standard on level M or level A, but might be going through a review. So it might be a medium emphasis or a low emphasis, but you'll start to notice that the, the high emphasis areas are the skills that are being emphasized at that specific level. I'm going to jump over real quick to our TABE website, and I'm going to go there to tabetest.com. This is our public website, just to show you where those resources are 
under the resource tab, there's a table 11 and 12 section. Within that table 11 and 12 section, we can go down to practice items and blueprints, and there we'll find all the TAB blueprints that you can have access to. So we looked at the level D reading, which is right here on the right-hand side. I'm gonna open up the level A math as another example. This example, and I'm trying to make this a little bit bigger, it's easier to see. Uh, the level math blueprint shows that there's five areas that are being covered against the standards. And, but very quickly, the two of those areas, algebra and, func and functions take up over half the test. So again, if I'm preparing somebody for the highest level of math, I know that those two areas are gonna use up most of the questions on the test. I can scroll down and start to look at the detail and see within geometry, which was 15% of the test, there are four subdomains. Only one of those four is a high emphasis area. So using volume formulas for cylinders, pyramids, cones, and spheres to solve problems is a targeted skill for level A of tape math. And so we see that as a high emphasis. Up at the very top, the no precise definition of angle, circle, perpendicular line, parallel line, and line segments. That is more of a beginning skill that is, is introduced earlier in TAPE. So this is just a review area. And we see that as a low emphasis area. So again, teachers or curriculum planners can use these blueprints to understand where the emphasis levels are for that. There is a, a question in the chat about, is there gonna be a printable version of this training? And we're, we are recording the training and I will certainly provide the resource center, the PowerPoint, so you'll have the slides to use after today as well, but we'll also have a, a recording from the service center as well, or the resource center, sorry. Let me jump back to our PowerPoint presentation and talk about TAB Online specifically. So within TAB Online, uh, we do have a locator available. The locator is also something that's available on, on the paper. And as we mentioned earlier, the only thing that's missing from TAB Online is level L, that literacy level. So you have access to EMDNA, you have access to reading math and language and also the writing test, and then programs that do use uh, the online system could use the Class E system for online ESL testing as well. One of the other areas that we want to talk about is uh, the, the types of questions that are used on TABE. And so this chart will start to show where different types of questions are being used. And in the first column that we see is the third column from the left, it's evidence-based selected response. You'll notice that those are only covered on the reading. That's a big uh, set of words to say that they're two-part reading questions. So the two-part reading questions are introduced at level E and then um, used more extensively at level A. So we see 15 of them used on level A. The next column over, we see the technology enabled types of questions. These are the drag and drop, the matching, the fill in the blank. We see a few of them being used in reading, but more of them being used in language and math math where you're maybe manipulating a graph uh, or using the protractor, um, language where you're dragging words into sentences and selecting sentences and paragraphs. So using the technology of the online system, things that you couldn't necessarily do with a paper and pencil test. Uh, if you are using paper and pencil for any purpose, the same standards are always being covered, but they would be covered with a traditional multiple choice question for that. And then we see also the, the type or the number of passages. So we do see an increase of reading as the, the test increases on the number of passages being used for the selected questions. For timing, the timing of the test, uh, we have two different areas of timing. We have the uh, allowable time, which I'll use for reading here is 100 minutes, two sections of 50 minutes each. And then we have the average time, what, what we're seeing as a feedback. Now, these average times were collected a little over a year ago, maybe a little bit more than a year before the pandemic. So something that we might be updating a little bit in the next part of the fall here is to look at what are the new average times because familiarity with the standards, both on an instructional side and the student side, may have decreased these average times. The U.S. Department of Ed has a requirement that 
we set our time to where 90% of the students taking a test finish within that allotted time. So within 100 minutes on reading, 90% of the students are finishing based on the research that we've collected. If we can show the Department of Ed that within 90 minutes, 90% um, of the students are finishing, then we can certainly reduce the allowable time down for TABE. And that's something that we, we plan on looking at this fall to see if these averages have changed. And, and certainly if you wanna put in the chat, I would be happy to or interested in hearing if you generally have students taking all the time or do you see the majority of your students finishing ahead of time? Just as an example of some of the questions with the, the different technology here, we see this is a language question. Um, what you're noticing is two open spaces in the question, but you have five possible words to drag into those two open spaces. So again, kind of a multiple choice, but more active multiple choice. So we're, we're, we're not selecting uh, one answer over another um, on an A, B, or C type of multiple choice. We're dragging these words in to complete these sentences. There are those multiple select types of questions that are used. And uh, I've highlighted in the right-hand side that, that we do provide the information. We're not trying to trick the students. We say which two sentences would best introduce the passages. So they need to select two because that was the instruction in the question. If they try to select three, the system will stop them so they can't select more than three for that as they go forward. And then the evidence-based selected response. Those were those reading questions that we saw um, a little bit earlier. And, and the evidence-based selected response is designed to raise the depth of knowledge and the higher order thinking skills for those students um, beyond a, multi a traditional multiple choice question. So evidence-based selected response a multiple choice question is technically a selected response. So this is just a, a fancier selected response, but evidence-based means that it's the two parts. In part one, we see the, well, the essay on the left-hand side is about quirky quicksand. Then we have part one that says, which statement expresses a claim the author makes about quicksand? Loosely saying, what's the main idea of the, of the essay? Part B then asks, what's the passage from the, the essay that best supports your answer? So again, you're picking the, the main idea and then you're supplying evidence to support your answer. Uh, again, raising the depth of knowledge and, uh, for that type of question. These are two point questions. Students can get zero, one, or two points. If I get A and B correct, I get two points. If I get one, uh, part A correct and part B incorrect, I can get one point. If I get part B correct, but part A incorrect, I get zero points because you can't get the evidence correct without having the main idea correct as well. So uh, the computer will do all the scoring, but just in case you ever have a, a scenario when you're using a paper test and have to hand score, um, just know that there are scoring rules for that as well. The traditional first step for TABE is to give the student a locator test. The locator test is a short placement test. It is used to place a student that has some familiarity or some level of understanding of the topic. So they may have some basic math skills, but we want to assess where their math skills are specifically so that we're measuring them. The goal of TABE is always to have a student demonstrate their strengths and their weaknesses. We don't want to have a student get every question correct. We don't want to have a student get every question wrong. If they get every question right, we know everything that they know, but we don't know anything that they don't know because we don't have any weaknesses yet. And on the opposite side, if you get every question wrong, you may have some uh, ability and some skills lower, but we didn't measure you though on those skills. So the goal of the locator is to adjust the main test to one of the levels that is within your functional area. So assigning a level E, M, D, or A test for reading and math and language specifically. We typically only use the locator during the pretest or ahead of the pretest. 
the locator does have scoring rubric or scoring breakouts and um, many programs and we'll see the settings for this use the automatic locator within the tape online system but know that you can do the locator as a standalone test if you choose to and the the test will still be scored you can run a locator report uh, but you can then also analyze it so you may have a student uh, that gets a, a nine on the level uh, i'm sorry an 11 on the level m locator or the on the reading locator and it was the system would place them in the level m test so getting 11 points on the reading locator says you should take level m well that's the highest possible score if i had an intake interview or some educational background on a student that said they were getting you know straight a's in in english and language classes they love to read. They gave you some examples that they're reading Pride and Prejudice and all these larger novels. You know, then you, you might have an inclination to move that student up to level D of the pretest. So you have some flexibility. It's generally one and a quarter points up or down on the locator. I will the loc on the automatic locator will go specifically by the rules of the chart. But you, if you have some students that you do have an intake background on, you may find that a better use of the locator is to do it as a standalone test. It does take a little more time because you're incorporating more pieces of information. Uh, a lot of programs will just have the student take the locator as part of the automatic process and then move right into the pretest. Um, they may or may not have an educational history of the student. So the locator can function independently, but is also designed to, to ideally function as a piece in the puzzle. I have your locator results, I have your educational background, I have your intake interview feedback, and then I can place you into a program. But I do realize that a lot of programs don't have that time and, and time is very precious during intake as a process. So it does have an automatic locator. As part of that, we want to encourage students not to guess on the locator. If a student does guess correctly, it could bump them up to a higher level test. So let's again use this as example on math. I have nine, eight or nine questions, right? And I'm running out of time on the time on the locator and I randomly fill in the last couple of questions and get two more right. Now I have 10 or 11 correct the system is going to assign me the level D test. I'm going to be exposed to math standards and competencies that I might not be ready for because I'm, I probably should be in the middle of level M, but I went ahead and guessed and it bumped me up to a higher test. So we might have a student that is at a potential of having an out of range math test just simply because they guessed on the locator. So I would strongly encourage you as part of the intake process to tell students to, to do the best that they can. There is no passing score on tape for this process for the locator. It's just a placement process. So we don't want you to guess. We want to just demonstrate your ability level and, and then we'll move forward with our pretest from there. I'm going to switch over to our TAB portal here in a moment, but before we do go into the TAB portal for the technology side, I'm going to go back to our TAB website, tabetest.com, just to point out a few other resources that might be useful for teachers and administrators that are preparing for TAB. So under the resource category, under TAB 11 and 12, another great resource under the math heading is the reference sheets. So we can open up the reference sheets and we see that these are the formulas for the TAPE math test. They are labeled at the top what test they're specifically for. So as I scroll through, you see the locator, then level E. What you'll also notice is that the formulas will start to increase. We'll see perimeter area on level E, as I go to level M, we see perimeter and area, but we add volume and conversions. And at the bottom, uh, level D, we see the Pythagorean theorem getting added in. So we're adding uh, to that. I, I would not recommend uh, giving the level D or level A formula sheet for every student, because if you gave this formula sheet 
to a level E tester, they might get a little uh, uh, anxious about that and seeing all these different formulas. So I would recommend only using the formulas for the specific test that you're delivering. In TAME Online, these formulas are built into the system. There's an icon for the student to open up the formula sheet. You can certainly use a hard copy of the formula sheet uh, during testing if the student prefers that. So you have that option of doing that. You also have the ability to use these PDF files during your teaching time. So if you wanna use the hard copy, you can do that as well in instructional purposes. Another resource under table 11 and 12 under the practice items and blueprints is the practice items. A lot of programs wanna know what's on the test and what, what are some sample questions. We do have printable files for the sample questions. So I'll open up the level M reading samples. And here we see an essay about whale watching. And then we, after the essay, we have seven questions related to that. So what type of whale can be seen by whale watchers on both East Coast and West Coast? And we can have, you know, hand this out as an exercise. We can use this as a group exercise. At the very end, after question seven, and question seven happens, happens to be a two-part evidence-based selected response, um, but we have an answer key. So you, would, you have the answers that are available. Some programs use this as a handout during orientation. Some email it out to students as they're registering, you know, just to get them familiar. These sample questions are the exact same samples that the student will see at the start of the test. So the goal of the sample questions on the tape test is to familiarize the student with the types of questions they are about to be measured on. If we do that ahead of time, that may reduce our, our testing time within the on, the on the day of testing if you've already reviewed the sample questions. So some programs use these printed samples as, as a way to uh, orientate students to what they're about to be measured during the testing day uh, as a best practice. So you certainly have access to those areas as well. Also under the resource tab, there are crosswalks and we'll come back to the crosswalks to look at the standards, um, but you have access to that. Um, we have access to some other uh, scoring and reporting that we'll come back to and look at a little bit later after we've looked at the test in more detail. So I'm gonna jump back to our PowerPoint slide and, and pick up with our DRC portal. So the DRC portal is your entry point as administrators into the TABE online system. Whether it's TABE 11 and 12, TABE class E, even if you're doing paper and pencil testing and you're scanning the answer sheets, that's done through the TABE portal as well. If you're um, uh, an offline site using the TABE offline, you actually you access the portal as well as an administrator to start that process. So the DRC portal is the, the entry point for almost all things related to TABE. You as an administrator can get into this portal just by going to the website and logging in with your email and your password. So very similar to online banking, you can get into the system from any device that you have. Uh, our support team generally says Chrome is the preferred browser, but it does work with all the other browsers. Um, so you, know, you can get in there to look at data, set up tests, access reports, anytime you wanna go to that portal. When you first log into the portal, as I mentioned, it does start with your email address and a password. That password is one that you had set when you first were set up in the TABE online system. There's always a way to reset your password at the bottom. So you can always have that as, as a utility and to set up your own or reset your password. Once you log into the system, you'll have different access permissions. And some people might see a very short menu screen up here under my applications, and other people might see a long menu option. So it all depends on what permissions were granted to you within the system. I can say that the folks at the resource center have more permission than a, than a local administrator potentially. I have more permissions than the resource center, so I can go across the whole country. So it's just the, the, the whole system is based on permissions and, and what you have access to. 
I'm going to jump over real quick to the live environment, but just a couple of more slides here about the, the portal. Oops, let me go back. When we're in the portal, one of the, the general areas is our general information. This general information tab allows you to have access to some information that we post. We do post announcements, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but we also post documents and downloadable files. Under the announcements, we post what I would consider less urgent announcements because I've already got logged into the portal and I've had to click into these announcements. So it's not something that we present to you right away on, on the login screen, which I'll show you in a moment. So you can see some different announcements on the announcements tab. Under the documents tab, we post all the secure documents that you can have access to. So at the very top, we see the full user guide for the portal. So if you want to read 120 some pages of fun, you can you know, download the PDF file for the user guide and go through all of that. At the bottom, we have some of the technical, te technical documentation for TAME. We also have scoring guides and test directions that are there. So they're all available in a PDF format. You see the link on the far right of the PDF link. And you can have access to those manuals um, once you've logged into the portal. So the portal has some resources, just like our public website, but they're the more secure resources that we have after you've logged into the system. And then lastly, the download tab is where your IT team goes to set up your testing computers. The downloads tab in the middle column, you'll see the platform, whether it's Apple, Chromebook, Mac, Windows, depending on what computers you have at your facility, your IT team can go ahead and download the install button for any of those environments so that you can turn your computers into testing computers. I'm going to try to make this uh, minimize this real quick and go down to my desktop if I can get there real quick. You'll notice that I have up on the top right here two icons. I have one for Tabe Online and one for Tabe Offline. So I've gone into that download area and downloaded the install uh, application for Tabe Online so I can turn my laptop into a, a testing computer if I need to for that. I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint. Let me jump over to our actual portal and I'm gonna log into the portal this time, uh, just as we saw in the PowerPoint. So I have my email address and my password and I've logged in. The first thing we see when we log in is that you've been welcomed into the system, but then we also have some announcements that are posted here. These are the more urgent announcements that we wanna draw your attention to because they're right on the home screen. You don't have to go into my applications and go into general information and then go into um, announcements to see them. They're right on the main screen for you. So we want to keep that available for you. I'm going to go back to that screen here real quick. Yep. Also on this main screen, we have a couple of other links. One is our phone number for our support team. I'll have this at the end of the PowerPoint as well, but 866 282 2250 is your access to our support team. There's no cost to call the support team if you're ever having a technology issue with TABE, whether it's the scanning, online or offline testing, they can always help you out with that. There's a link to our public website, tabetest.com. There's a link to our device check. If you're not sure, if you're doing remote testing and you're not sure if your student's home computer can be used for TABE testing, you can send them this link. So the drcdevicecheck.com, if a student opens this link at home, it asks them to run this test. If they click on test, it will quickly assess their home computer to see if it passes the requirements for TAME testing. And instead of you asking them, what browser do you have? What operating system do you have? How much memory do you have? You can just do that device check real quick and and see if a student can test at home with their computer. The last link I'm going to show is the the status uh, system, and this is if you if you're having trouble in our in our portal. Sometimes it's our system, sometimes it's the internet, or sometimes it's your local network that's having trouble. This status link 
will always be available for you to click on. And if I click on that status link, it will open up how our portal is functioning. And our portal is divided into three sections. One is the main portal that you're using for administrative purposes. And we see that that is operating normally. The last one is the online testing portal for students. So if uh, you'll see that that is operating correctly. Sometimes we have updates happening over weekends and the student side will continue to function because we're up updating some of the administrative side. So you might not be able to register students or run reports, but if you have a student already registered, they can continue to test. The middle one is the educator scoring. That's the area with the rubrics for the reading and the speaking test for class E. And that is a separate part in our portal. So they, they, they alert you if that is operating correctly as well. So again, a lot of good information just on the home screen when you log in to the TAVE online system. Under that My Applications tab, we have a lot of different areas that we can go into. Uh, some of them are for IT people, some of them are for more of an administrative person, some are for test proctors. And we'll go through several of them here during the training. Um, we've already talked about the general information tab, so we won't go into that. But I'm going to just start over on the left-hand side. We have a couple of areas. We have user management and student management. I'm going to go into student management real quick. And student management is really our tabled database of student records. And if we go into manage students, it allows us to pull up existing students. One of the key things to remember about the TAB online system is any screen that you're on, it looks very inviting to start typing somebody's last name or their first name or their ID number. But what you'll notice on the bottom corner of the screen is that it's a search button. It's not an add button. So I'm managing students. I'm going to look for a student first before I add a brand new student into my system. I'm going to go ahead and go into my uh, practice account. So I'm in my training account, and I have a couple of different sites, one for offline testing and one for tape testing. And now I can go ahead and if I need to, if I have somebody standing in front of me that wants to register, I can type in their first name and just hit find. So it's going to search my location and find anybody with the first name Mike. I will tell you that we probably should never use the name Mike. We should always use Michael because they're probably in your state database as Michael, but uh, I have them listed here as Mike for, for that purpose. So I have three different mics. I have th two mics that have the same ID number that were born on the same day. So they're duplicates. Somebody must have entered them separately. Um, we do want to check here before we create a brand new student. I'm going to go ahead and take away the mic this time and just add the last name Johnson. And we have quite a few Johnsons because I do a lot of different family names. So we see a lot of different Johnsons in here. Um, some of them with ID numbers, some without ID numbers. And right now it's telling me at the very bottom that there's 35 records in my account with the same last name. So I can certainly search for all of them. I see only one Keeley Johnson that's in the system. So if I have another Keeley Johnson uh, and I will use the date of birth as the differentiator to see that this person was born on January 1st. Uh, you'll see I use January 1st quite a lot. Uh, on my examples uh, throughout this. So again, I encourage you when you have a brand new stu student to always use the search features. If you don't find that student at the very bottom, we can add a brand new student into our database. So I can go ahead down at the bottom and click add student. And when I click on the add student, it'll bring up the required fields for adding a student. So I'll use Johnson again as the last name. I'll use Jessica as my future daughter-in-law here anytime whenever my son gets off the, the pot. And I don't have an ID number assigned for her, but I could use maybe parts of her date of birth as a potential ID. Again, ID you'll notice is not a asterisk field. So it's not a required field, 
but it is encouraged just because you might have students with the same name. Uh, down below, we do need a date of birth, so we'll put in zero or July 1st for this student. And then the gender, those are the required fields. You'll notice that um, we do have other boxes, accommodations, demographics. I'm going to go into demographics, and, and you'll notice that there are no required fields in demographics. This might be changing in the future because our research team uses a lot of tape data for some research projects, and they need to have some different demographics for students' results when they're comparing them for some of our federal applications. So you might see some demographics changing in the future, not immediately, but it's been talked about internally. What you're noticing these demographics are is the front page of the paper answer sheet. So if you remember to, about paper testing, they used to fill out a lot of bubbles. They are copied over here in the online format as well. There is also an area for accommodations. You can grant accommodations for TABE and use that uh, to allow the use of accommodations. You'll notice that the accommodations are broken out by the different test areas. So TABE 11 and 12 and TABE Class E on the far right-hand side, they're generally the time accommodations, giving extra time. The very last one, the text-to-speech is, is available there. If you do do text-to-speech, you do also have to allow for unlimited time. That's a requirement for, for text-to-speech. These allowances are following the state accommodations policy. You grant the accommodation here after it's been validated with whatever the policy requires on the state side. So you do not have to turn in any documentation to us for accommodations, but this is the area where you would provide the accommodation for the student. Typically, you would try to do this before the student has tested. Um, there are times where a student might take a test, they do poorly, you talk to them afterwards and you say, well, I ran out of time. And in the past, I've always had extra time added to my test. And then you can dig a little deeper and understand their need for an accommodation and add that for any future tests going forward. We can hit save on this. And now we've just saved this student to our database. One thing you know or notice is that we didn't talk about a test. We really just talked about a database record. So student management is really just creating database records for students that might be in your program. The student management system can be done with an upload as well. You see the upload, that's really just a spreadsheet of first name, last name, date of birth, and gender. Um, those are the required fields from the, the, the main section. Student management can be used a couple of different ways. You can hold a registration event for your program. Maybe that's a live event where you have students come in and fill out registration cards and you get 150 registration cards. Well, you know you're only going to get 25 or 50 of those people to come back to your program, or you only have space for 25 or 50, but at least you have the names of these potential students. You could put them into your student management system. There's no issue with adding names to the student management system. I would all encourage you to do that with their full name and their full information. There was a question about duplicate records. We cannot merge records um, in our system. I, I, I should say we cannot merge records very, very easily. I can't do it. Our support team can't do it. It has to go several levels up in our development team right now. They are working on trying to figure out a way uh, to do that a little bit easier, but sometimes it has to do with rights and you know student records and, and keeping track of data that might be in those records. So there's some uh, regulations around that a little bit, but uh, we are trying to look at ways to merge multiple records. So I would encourage you whenever you do add a student to student management, make sure you're using what you would use in your data system. So again, Jessica versus Jesse, Mike versus Michael, however you want to have that student tracked in the future, this is, is how it's saved in the system. 
it doesn't matter if these students never show up because they're just a database record. You're not being charged for anything. There's no, there's no tracking of these students. It's just a database record that you could potentially assign a test to later. So we've created students in the student management field. The other area is to create staff people and staff people for TAME Online is called user management. And I'm gonna go a little bit into user management, but if you were uh, paying attention last week, we held a national webinar uh, to announce that the user management system is changing. Uh, in about a month or so, they're gonna be updating user management. So I, I don't have all the updates. We, we covered a few of them on the national webinar and we can certainly have an Arkansas focused webinar after the change, but user management is used to set up employees, staff people, volunteers, teachers, anybody that will access the system that's not a student, not a test taker. And it starts the very same way. You're looking for somebody. So I can, again, look for the first name, Mike, and click Find User, and it will find all the mics in my account, and I don't have any. So I can delete Mike, and let's go to last name Johnson and see if I've added other users with the same last name. And we see we don't have any of those. So I can also just leave the fields empty and click on find user. And what it will do, it will find all the users in my account. So now I have a list of all the users that are in this TABE training account that have access to this system. So again, I, I can go into that. You'll notice that under the school area, we have two schools. So I'm only looking in one site. I could change that to look at every site. And again, this might be more of the resource centers function, or if you're in a facility that has multiple sites, you could search across multiple sites. But now we see my list increase a little bit. Um, I don't have the number here, but the, the, least, the list got longer because I added the second site into the system. Now I have all these staff people. So I see William Burnus here listed. I could go in on the far right-hand side as a higher level administrator and change his records. You'll notice that it tells me that he's never logged into his account. I have that yellow bar that says it's not active. But if it was active, I could add another location. So again, in Little Rock, you know, I'll just use Little Rock as the example. You know, we could have a, a an east, a west, a north, and a south location. Does Bill Burnus get access just to north, or does he have access to north and east, or all four sites within a location? So as a lead administrator for your site, you have the ability to give specific permissions to each individual employee or staff person. This will be changing a little bit. That's why I'm not gonna go too far into it. Um, but it is based on the, the rights that you give them. And, uh, and I'll, I'll show it real quick again, just to show you it, it, some of these areas will stay the same. But if I go to add new permissions to Bill, and let me say I'm going to give him district access to our, and I'll, I'll pick the Arkansas state account. So now Bill is going to be a new staff person for Arkansas. He can give get standard permission because they're highlighted and I can move them over. So I can very quickly add additional permissions to Bill's account. So I just added the Arkansas access to his TABE sales training access. I can also take that access away very quickly just by deleting it. So again, lead administrators at each site can add new staff people and give those staff people specific access permission. If you are one of those lead people, I encourage you to look at last week's webinar or um, in a couple of weeks when the full new system launches, we'll do some more webinars related to that as well. So up on the top, we've gone through student management and user management. Both of these are not used rel that often. Um, you know, user management, when you have new staff come on board, student management, maybe when you have an enrollment activity for that. But the one you use on a day-to-day -day basis is test management. And so we'll go ahead and open up test management. 
And inside test management, our main function is to manage our test sessions. A test session is a testing scenario, whether it's a pre-test or a post-test, a progress test, a locator test, anything that's a testing scenario would have a test session created for it. And I often think of test sessions as file folders. If you put a file in a, in a filing cabinet, you typically put a name on that file and then in that folder, and then you put things inside that folder. We do the same thing with test management. We create a testing scenario. We put a name on that scenario, and then we go ahead and add people or add things into that scenario when they arise. So we'll look at some existing scenarios, and I'm not going to pick on anybody specific, so I'm just going to scroll through here. And um, if we look at, I'm going to pick Northwest Technical just randomly here. And I'm going to just show all their sessions. But before I do that, I'm going to pick only Table 11 and 12 and only Table 11. So they may have Class E sessions at, at Northwest Tech, but I'm just looking for any session that they've created already for Table 11 specifically. And when it refreshes down below, we see that they have 110 sessions already created that re re include table 11. And what I want to draw your attention to is the third or fourth column over from the left, the session name. And they do a great job here at Northwest Tech. Uh, I will tell you that it's not so random that I picked them. I looked at it a little earlier this morning. But this session name kind of tells you what this session is. So here they say 2022 to 2023, table 11M, math only without the locator. So I know exactly what's inside this test session just by the name of it that they gave. So we see a couple of other ones, table 11 D reading only. If I was to click on the pencil out on the far right hand side and open up this test session, what I will see is that the, oh, I'll wait for it to pop up here, is that the session name up in the top left corner it's kind of hidden there, but again, 11M math only, that's what the session is. And it doesn't have the locator. So they selected the criteria to match the title of that session. Uh, and we see that we have one student in that session. It is a requirement to have at least one student in a test session when you create it. A lot of programs will use a placeholder student. Um, you know, so I use Mike Johnson a lot because that when I create a test session, I just put myself into the test session. It doesn't cost anything to add a student to a session. The only time usage is tracked is when that person starts a test. So Gabriella was registered. You know, she may or may not be a real student. She may be the, the person that created this test session, but she hasn't started the test yet. Um, because we saw that going back to the beginning screen. I'll, I'll close out of this. And it will show us back in the beginning that this session that we used, this very first one, shows not started. Some of them will show in progress. If we scroll far enough and look back, we see some paper ones. So um, these folks are doing some scanning of paper tests, uh, maybe at a, a alternate location that looks like they're a little bit older. So maybe they've transitioned to tape online, but we have some information there. What you'll see also up at the top is that this X on the right-hand side is active. Until there is testing data in a session, you can delete that session. But you'll notice all the other ones that are marked in progress, the X is shaded and I can no longer click on it. So if you do, create a test session. You don't have to delete it if nobody shows up. Like Gabrielle, if she never shows up, we can just keep that test session. But if you want to clean up your screen, you can delete that. We are also in the process of doing some archiving. So um, I'm, let me go back up to the top here. And I didn't check here, but um, let's see if they have any tape 9 and 10 sessions, old sessions that are taking up space here. and they may or may not, but our, our technology team is going back and doing archiving. And, and we do see one tape nine session listed here. 
They are in the process of archiving older test sessions that are inactive, especially for nine and 10. Eventually when all the archiving will happen, they will have a, a rolling 18 months of activity. That is the goal is to keep just 18 months of activity visible and archive the other data from that. So we saw an example of, of some good test sessions from, from this location in Northwest Technical. I'm gonna go in to my practice account. Actually, I'll, I'll just stay here with these guys. And I'm gonna go ahead and create a brand new session. So I looked at all the sessions that were there for table 11, I didn't see the one I wanted. So I'm gonna go ahead and click add session at the bottom. The first thing that I need to do is what test is this? And I'm just gonna call it math. Well, that's not a very specific test. So math 11, and I'll say, uh, and actually I'm gonna change this to my intake. 20, uh, 22 September intake reading math and language and the locator. So for 2022, anybody that's coming into my program for new in September, I have an, a pre-test that I'm gonna start setting up. I didn't say what it was, so I'm gonna go ahead in the front here and just say TABE 12. So I'm gonna say TABE 12 is my pre-test for September. So I'm gonna select TABE 12 from the left-hand box. And now it gives me the option, do I wanna select a content area or do I wanna select the auto locator? And I, in my title, I did put with the locator, so I wanna select the auto locator. When I do select the auto locator on the right-hand side, now I can either accept or deselect de a content area. And I included reading, math, and language, so I'm gonna leave this the way it is, but I could deselect one of them if I choose and just do reading and language in this test session if you choose to do that. So I'm gonna leave them all selected in this scenario. Now, if I turn the locator off and turn on just reading, for example, it will let me select the E, M, D, or A. So if this was my post test instead of my intake test, I might be creating a scenario that is tape reading level M, math level D, or some, some alternative to that. And uh, we can create as many sessions as we need for that, but I'm gonna go back and leave my auto locator turned on. Couple of things down below that we wanna talk about, the date range. It automatically extends out to 2025. You can leave that alone if you choose to. It's not that big of a deal. Some programs will shorten that to say 2022. One security feature for the date range is that if you do pre-print your test tickets for testing and those test tickets get out, they are valid for that whole date range that that test session was created. So if we had a test session that ends, let's say even in September, I could change this to 09. That means anybody I put into this test session can only test this month. The test ticket that I create for this is only going to work in our system for that month. You can be specific if you need to. Generally, you're only specific if you have a public lab. On Mondays, we do tape testing. On Tuesdays and Wednesdays, the lab is open for students to use for whatever they want. Well, we don't want a student that partially tested on Monday to come back in and take a test unproctored on Tuesday or Wednesday. So we could even narrow that testing window down more if we need to. Moving across from the right-hand side, we see the next one is listed as mode and it's not selectable. The only time that this would be selectable is if you've purchased remote proctoring tokens from us for ProctorU, which is our vendor partner to do proctoring for, for tape tests. We offer two different ways to do remote testing, either you as your own staff monitor the students or you can pay to have a vendor do that and that would be ProctorU. If you've paid to have ProctorU watch the test taking process, this would become active and it would change over to online or proctored 
And if it's set as Proctor, then ProctorU has access to the session. So that was just a, a function to give ProctorU access to the test session for that purpose. The next two buttons look very inviting, and I will encourage you never to touch them. Um, they are they were created as part part of the process for K twelve testing. They all we also share the engine with the K twelve state tests that that are delivered across the country in the same Insight platform. Test monitoring. If you're interested, you can go to the full user guide and and read about it. It might be something that you want to look at. It allows you to to look at the students taking a test. Now you're not looking at their screen. But you're following along that you know one student has answered five out of 20, the other student is on 10 out of 20. So you kind of can follow the progress of a student. So you're monitoring the test there. And um, again, it's it could be listed as optional or required, and it is defaulted to none. And I encourage you to leave it as none. Restricted access is either true or false, and, and that seems inviting but again I, I encourage you not to click on it leave it as false if you do happen to click on it as true it will require students to have a third password for the test to start so if you've ever encountered your students raising their hand saying i entered my username and password from the test ticket but it's asking for another password that's because the person that created the test session turned on restricted access. Again, more of a K-12 function. If you think about in the K-12 world, you have uh, a district full of third graders taking the state test. They're all, you're trying to herd all those cats in the one classroom, in the one, one lab. You want them all to start at nine o'clock in the morning. Well, the front row is made up all, of all the, the, the students that are ready to go. The back row are the students that are still talking. And you're trying to get everybody to start at nine. How do you stop the front row from starting at 8.50? And how do you get the back row to start at nine? We turn on restricted access. What that does is it sets a third password for the entire group. And I can write that password on the whiteboard right at nine o'clock and everybody can start on time. With TABE and adults, we typically let them go into the computer lab and test at, you know, when they come in at nine o'clock, there might be another person that comes in at 9.30. So you're not necessarily restricting the access to start on a standardized time. So I encourage you to, again, leave access alone um, unless there's a really large group of students that you're working with and, and you want them all to start. You know, maybe in a correctional setting, that might be a case. So if that is the case, you can certainly find out more about restricted access in the user guide. So we've set the parameters of our test session. We set the date range. We don't have any students in our test session yet. We can go ahead and search for a student and I can search for a, for a student with a first name um, with S and see if we find anybody. So I'm just looking for anybody in our location that has the first name that starts with an S and see if that's the same student that I'm working on. So down below, we have quite a few students that have an S as a first name. I'm, you know, maybe looking for a Steven and I don't see, you know, a Steven. I have a couple of Stevens here, but it's not the same Steven. So I can go ahead and add a new student. So I've looked for Steven in my system. He's not here. I can go ahead and add a new student right with the new student button. What you're going to see is that this new student button looks just like student management. So I'll put the last name of Johnson. I'll put Steven, uh, ID number 4455669900. Date of birth is 0101-2000. And mail for the gender. Not gonna give him any accommodations or anything, but I'll hit save. And I apologize for the folks at Northwest that I just added a student into your system, but Stephen has now been added to the test session on the right-hand side. Stephen has also been added into my database as uh, in student management. So when we talked about student management earlier, that's really applicable if you have a list of students. If you have a walk-up student, you just add that student directly into the, the session. 
So maybe you had somebody emailed you or called you. Uh, even if it's a couple of students, it's very quick to add a brand new student. So not unless you have a large intake process, do you necessarily have to go into student management? You can do that right inside of test management. As I mentioned earlier, there is a requirement to have at least one student in a session to save it. But the maximum we would like to have is about 50 students. If you get more than 50, the system will accept it, but it will start to slow down and screens will take longer to refresh. So it's, it's better to have just around 50 students or less in a session. And as I mentioned, you can create as many sessions as you need, um, but always kind of keep thinking. So I created this for September intake. If in September, we think we're gonna get 150 students to register, then maybe I wanna have the first week in September because that might be a 50 student kind of ballpark figure. Generally we create a session around those parameters of when do we expect 50 students to come in? A smaller program might have 50 students in six months or nine months or 12 months. So they may have a longer test session. A larger program might have a very short test session. I have seen people that made test sessions for every student. That is not needed. Um, that is a lot of extra work. You can certainly do that. So in the session name, it might say pretest Johnson, um, for example. You don't have to do that. You can make a session for a scenario. So Mike Johnson or Steven Johnson are all coming in in September. They may come in the first week of September. They may come in the last week of September. I have a session ready for them. You know, in the paper and pencil world, think of this as a file folder in the cabinet. I open up the September folder and there's tape test answer sheets in there waiting for the student to arrive. I take one out and hand it to them. Here I'm waiting for the student to arrive and I can put them into this test session. I can go ahead and click save. And this will take me back to my main window. And we see that we have, uh, and I'm still searching on tab nine, so I'm gonna switch to tab 12. Oops, I'm gonna click on the right one. And I'll show our sessions for tab 12. And we're gonna show all the tab 12 ones but we only have one at the very top that's ending in September 30th, and that's the one that I just created. So this session is sitting here. I can come out here, you know, again, tomorrow, somebody walks into our program and says, hey, I'd like to enroll, and you happen to have a seat available. You log into the tape system. You see the session listed there for September. Click on the pencil. Wait for it to open up. Go down to the bottom. Click on New. And this time we'll go ahead and, and ask the person what their name is. And they'll say their name is, last name is Johnson. Uh, Thomas, two, 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 two. And we get their date of birth. And mark their gender and hit save. Now they're registered in our test session. We've added them to our test session. And at the bottom of the page, we can hit save. So we save that record. And then our next step is back at our main screen is to print the test ticket for that student or students to take a test. And we can print test tickets two different ways. There's a spreadsheet icon out to the right-hand side, or there's a printer icon. The difference between the two of them is the printer icon will print every test ticket automatically. The spreadsheet icon lets you select the students before you print them. So today we only have two students in there. That's not a big deal. But at the end of the month, when we have 50 students in there and you wanna print one test ticket, you don't wanna hit the printer icon because that will print everything. We wanna print the, uh, select the spreadsheet icon and it'll pull up 
our students listed, we see that Thomas is listed there. And we can go down to the bottom and print the selected one. And what this will do is open up the test ticket for that student. And we have two pages for our test ticket. Let me make that a little bit bigger. Page one is for you as a test administrator. It tells you who to expect. His name's Thomas, his ID number, his username and password if he, if he needs it. Over on the right-hand side, where you're at, what test session it is. And then page two is the test ticket itself. You can print this. They do print four to a page. So you might cut them up for each student, but it's telling Thomas to go sit down at a computer and enter in his username of tjohnson2058 and then the password to start his test. So you can get a student registered and ready to test in a very few minutes uh, if they're brand new to your program by adding them to an existing session. If this was a live session that somebody had already tested, another useful area for that spreadsheet icon is this started and completed category. It would actually show you the time, not just the date. So we could see that he started at 1027 and ended at 1031, for example. And if, if he did poorly on that test, maybe the, the, the three minutes that he spent on the test was a contributing factor to the poor score. So, so sometimes when students do very poorly on a test, it's good to come back to the screen, look at the time that they spent on the test to see if they actually spent the allotted time. And then we can determine, did they actually give up? Was the test too hard? Uh, maybe what were the circumstances for that? So again, that was a, a, some of the functionality under the blue spreadsheet icon. You can also unlock or lock a test ticket. If a student accidentally exits out of a test, you can unlock it for them if you need to on that spreadsheet icon. A couple of other functions on this action bar on the right-hand side, we see the, the if you wanna download all the information, again, if you have 50 students in your test session, you can export that out to an Excel file with the little green download arrow. This session that we created, which was TAB 12 September intake, if you do this on a monthly basis, this middle icon that says copy might be useful. And what, what it does is it copies your test session and allows you to create another one for that. So I can click on the copy real quick, let it open up. And as it's opening up into the system, I'll just wait for it, hopefully. But what it does is it creates the exact same test session and allows you to type over the name. So we could change the name to October, for example. But all the parameters of the auto locator, the reading, the math, the language are all saved, TAB 12. And it's not opening for me, or I'm not going to be patient enough for, to wait to open. So I will stop there. And as I mentioned out on the, the far right, we have the spreadsheet icon and the printer icon. The last icon that I will go ahead and use is I can delete that session. So I'm not gonna leave this school's account muddied up with what I was doing. I'm gonna delete out this September intake session. I'll make sure that I delete that here so we can wait for that to refresh into the system. So that is test management. And again, that's the one that you use most often. You're, you're typically going to create a test session ahead of time. So today we're at September 1st. Hopefully any September sessions you, you created in, in August, but you can go ahead and create your, your October, your November, or your spring intake. If you're, if you're in a, a college program and you're coming up to a, ho a holiday break and you want to get everything done, you can create your test sessions for next semester ahead of time and just put that placeholder student in the session and then wait till you have actual students for intake for that. I'm going to log out and log back in real quick because it's sitting here thinking too long.
least I think it is. So let me do it this way. Well, we'll jump back to our PowerPoint while that's thinking. I'll close out my test ticket. I don't think I see any new questions in the chat, but certainly if there are any questions on test sessions, there was a question about merging data, and I talked about that we're in the process of trying to work on that, but uh, you you may have seen quickly on the, the Northwest Technical College account, they had some X's in front of some of the, the sessions, and that's their way of, of not, not using a session in the future is to change the name of that session. You can always go in and edit the name, and and you'll see that with students as well. We can put some X's or do not use in front of some students' names because if a student, if Mike Johnson was registered and Mike Johnson tested, then that record is in our system. We cannot delete that record. But then later on, the program goes in and enters Michael Johnson, and now Michael Johnson registers and, and takes a test. Now that data matches up with the database uh, in LACES, and then you can have that that score transfer into that system. So if that name is matching, it makes that data transfer process much easier for that. I'm going to jump back to our PowerPoint. I did have a, a quick slide on the scanning, just if any program is using paper and pencil. I, I, I hope that you're not hand scoring. If you If you are hand scoring, I just want to remind you that scanning is a free service. You just have to use a compatible scanner and compatible scanners start at about 199 on Office Supply or, or Amazon. So it's a very inexpensive way to start uh, to relieve some of that labor time of, of hand scoring a test. The other benefit of scanning is you have all your data go into the same database for transferring uh, for that access. Uh, and also the same data can transfer over you may have seen an announcement about essential education accepting tape data. If you're scanning or or anything, you'll have that information as well to, to transfer over. So we talked about quite extensively about user management. Again, anybody that's a staff person is a user. Um, and I'm not, you know, I, I mentioned that we're going to have that new user interface here launching in a month or so. So I'm not gonna go through all these slides again, but we will still have permissions, just a little bit of a change on how you set up the permission. So just know that. We talked about student management and setting up students as database records ahead of time. That's certainly okay, but we also saw the alternative of adding a student directly into a test session is a much quicker way of doing that. So we can, we can use student management if we have a large amount of students that we want to upload with an Excel file, but adding individual students into a test session is also a quicker way. We included the accommodations, so that information was there. Um, we didn't talk yet about modifications. Modifications are student-driven. They can change the color background. They can change the, the, the font size if they need to, to magnify things. So, those are not rights that you have to grant. That's access that every student has in the testing system. And we will see that in a little bit. We talked about test management and setting up good test sessions. Uh, you can have sessions for just a locator. You can have a session for a post test. You can have a session for a progress test. You can have lots of different sessions. When you're creating test sessions, this time chart is, is posted on the resource tab for test, tabetest.com. So it's always helpful to, to be cognizant of the time. If you're remote testing, we typically do one content area at a time. If you're testing in person, it's okay to create a test session for reading math and language, but just deliver the reading test today or just deliver the math test tomorrow. You can register a student for everything because you're controlling when they're going into the computer lab to take that test. When you're doing remote testing, you're not controlling access to that computer. So we want to register them just for one test at a time. Here's your test ticket for math. Here's a separate test ticket for reading. And we can do that based on the, a lot of time that's available. So just a couple of examples of other test sessions here. Here's a test session we saw 
with the locator turned on and we selected reading, math, and language. Here's a test session that is just level D of table 11. So you can create a level D test. You'll notice that the session name says screening reading only. It doesn't say table 11, it doesn't say September. So it's it's kind of specific, but not really a good name. I would, I would suggest a stronger name. Here we have a different test. Now we're doing a workforce screening, maybe for a local employer. You can create a test session for a local employer or for a workforce center if you're partnering with a, a workforce center and they want to have a specific test for their uh, candidates. So they want only reading and math and they want them set up at level D. So you can go ahead and, and, and create specific sessions, even if it's for a, a local employer, if you have that. We talked about the test monitoring and the restricted access, so we don't want to touch those. Um, you can always add and remove students from a test session. Remember, a test session is separate from student management. Once a student is in your database, they're there. It's whether you put them into a test session or not, uh, but they're always going to be in your database for future reference. And then we talked about adding new students with their accommodations. After um, a period of time, you'll be able to see all sessions that a student is listed in. So I could search and show all the sessions that have uh, a Mike Johnson in it or, or just a first name Mike and pull up all the different sessions. We also looked at the roster and the test tickets. Those are what you print out. If you are doing remote testing, we do hand these out uh, or cut and paste them into the chat feature. We don't email test tickets out. We don't email um, the web, the, the URL access for remote testing. We do all that through the chat feature to be more a little bit more secure from, from that standpoint. And then I mentioned earlier that the blue spreadsheet icon, if you click on it, you can um, print the selected test tickets in the bottom left corner, but on any student that has tested, you can see the start and end time. So in this example, this student, student started at 416 and ended at 418. If they did poorly on the test, that might be a contributing factor. So it's a, it's a good resource if you do want to do some additional investigation to come back and see how long they spent on the actual test. I'm going to jump over now. We've been looking at the administrative sides of the TAVE online system, and I'm going to switch over to the student side and look at what the student view is. And to do that, we can get to the student side two different ways. One was the icon that we had on my desktop that we saw earlier. Or another way is to use the, the URL for remote proctoring. This URL gets us to the same place for a student to log in. And I'll click on it real quickly. If you notice, it has two sets of numbers at the end. When that URL officially opens at the top of the screen, those numbers are gone. It's been redirected to a, a more generic URL for security purposes. So if you are going to use this URL for remote testing, always save and copy this URL, which happens to be on page five of the examiner guidelines for remote testing. So that's where we find that. But this URL needs to be used in its entirety, not the abbreviated one that we see on the page. A student then would log in with their username and password and they can begin to test. Instead of doing this through the actual test, I'm going to go back to tabetest.com and under the resource tab, about three quarters of the way down, there's a link for online tools training. This is the tutorial for TABE Online. It allows you to either send this to students. Down at the bottom, there's a link to, to, to the tutorial. There's some directions, but you can open up the tutorial and it looks just like what we saw earlier from what a student will see, except they cannot log in here. They can only take the tutorial. So the log in here button is missing. If they click on the online tutorial, <clears throat> you have access to tutorials for every section of TABE 
including writing. So if you want to look at what the writing test looks at, you can go out today to the online tutorial yourself, take the writing tutorial and see the sample questions. There are also samples for TAPE Class E. If you're not using Class E online already and you want to understand what it's about, you can click on the tutorials. Programs use these tutorials as pre-intake group sessions, or they email this link out to students to say, click on the reading one and take the practice test. I'm going to go ahead and take level M reading. I'm going to take the standard, not the audio. So you can use this in a lot of different ways. We provide the test ticket right on the screen. So the username and password are listed right on the screen. And I'll go ahead and type that in. And it will start the test. I'm starting a tutorial test, so it welcomes me into the system with the name of training student, what session I'm part of, which is my online tools training session, and a fictitious ID number for that student. When I click to the next screen, it presents the student with the menu of all the tests that they've been registered for. So this is a direct representation of what your test session is. If your test session was the auto locator with reading, math, and language, it would all be listed here for the student to start with and continue testing um, as they go through the testing process. This is specifically just the reading um, tutorial for level M. So I only have one option, but just be aware if you registered somebody for reading, math, and language, they would all be listed on this menu screen. I click on the reading M. This is the difference between computer-based testing and, and paper and pencil. The student will now start to work themselves through the test directions. Instead of uh, you reading the directions verbatim, they will read them themselves and click next at the bottom to go through. You can read the directions. There are printed scripts on the portal under the computer-based testing directions If you under the documentation tab. If you would choose to do that as a group activity, maybe that's better for the ESL students that are first be experiencing computer-based testing and you wanna lead them as a group, you can certainly do that. We provide the script to do that, but generally most students are working themselves through the directions. They can learn about the forward and back button. They can learn about the different utilities. And then they see the three circles that says your computer is operating correctly and you can begin the test. What we see here is an essay about whale watching. We've already seen this essay on the printed sample questions. We also saw this same question of what type of whales can be seen by whale watchers on both coasts. So this is an exact copy of the printed sample questions, which are also the same samples at the start of the test. So we're exposing in a third place where you might see these samples. And so you can use these in a lot of different ways. Um, looking at some of the utilities, a student might wanna use the highlighter and they can highlight different parts of the text. We can turn that highlighter off if we need to. We can take a sticky note if we wanted to take a note about whales, we can do that over here. And then we can close that note. We can increase the magnification. That might be an option too, maybe more so again on a, on a math test that we want to see a graph, we can do that. We can turn that magnification off. If I like to use a straight edge while I'm reading, I have the line guide. If this was a math test, the formula sheet and the calculator would be out here on the right-hand side of the utilities. Down on the bottom, I can change the color and font if I need to. So just the background, if I wanted to change the background, or I can change the background and the font at the same time if I need to for that modification. We can also uh, reverse the contrast and that really changes things up. But from some students that have visual modification needs, that may be the preferred way to, to view the screen. So again, this is all student driven during the test and another great use of the tutorial for them to practice. They can flag a question and see it later if they need to. They can go forward and skip questions. And I'm gonna go ahead and skip to question seven. 
Question seven happens to be that two-part question that we saw earlier, which of these is the main idea of the article? And I can then go to part B and say, what's what sentence from the article best supports your answer? And I'll go ahead and, and mark that. And then after question seven, I bring up a review screen that says I answered question one, but I flagged it. I skipped the middle of the test and I answered question seven. Students can go back by just simply clicking on the question and it'll take them right back to question two. Or there's a number bar at the top of the screen that they can jump around to different questions too. Ultimately, when the student is done, they click end test in the bottom right hand, left hand corner. And then they have to click on finish test or end test, I'm sorry. And then, then they have to hit submit. So I'm gonna go backwards here and back to the questions. You may have a student that sometimes will say, I accidentally exited out of the test. Well, I'm on question five. To accidentally exit out of the test, I have to hit end test, I have to hit end test again, and I have to hit submit, all three steps accidentally. So they should not accidentally exit out of the test too often. You might have the scenario that you have a, a fire alarm or a weather alarm that's happening during your test. Hopefully that you looked ahead that you don't have a fire drill. So if the alarm goes off, it's most likely an emergency. In that case, the best scenario is to somehow simulate the internet failing. By turning off the computer, you hold the power button for five seconds, it turns the computer off. By disconnecting the router, if you have a lab that has a router that has a switch, you can do that. Some fancy labs have a master power button on the wall, um, kind of like your gas station has an emergency switch. Any way that you can disconnect the electricity, it will disconnect the internet. And if the TAVE system senses a loss of internet, it will save itself and the time on the clock and let the student log back in once the connection has been reestablished. So again, if you have an emergency, Best case is for five seconds, hold down the power button. If that's not possible, you know, maybe there's a, a master internet switch. If not, the test sits idle for 20 minutes and then it is logged out automatically. But that is, is as if the student gave up and left the testing room and left the test running. Those 20 minutes are not recoverable. So again, it's always best to try to simulate the internet failing so that it saves itself and saves the time on the clock. If it is a scenario where the student got up and left or that you, you didn't have time to turn the computer off, uh, it might be a decision, is it better to start a new test with a fresh clock than pick up with 20 minutes already run off the clock from that standpoint. Going back to our tutorial again, under, under resources on the tape test, it's online tools training. You can go there today. You can share this link with students. You can do it as a group exercise. Uh, I, see it, I see this link posted to programs websites that they say go here to take some sample questions. So you can use it however your program sees fit. Uh, it's there. It does have to be done in Google Chrome. So there's some directions up here on how to use Google Chrome as the, the browser for that. It is also accessible when a student starts an actual test. So you'll see the same tutorial when a student logs in to an actual test, but hopefully they've experienced it beforehand so they can get right into their test for that scenario. I jumped through all these screens. I'm gonna go back here. So here's what a menu screen might look a little bit longer. Again, we have the reading locator, the reading sample items, the reading, part one and part two. We also have the math test. Some of these are highlighted off because they may have taken them already, but whatever you register a student for will show up on their menu screen. Different sample questions with all the different functions. Uh, the tutorial does not have the timer. So here's an example of the timer up in the top left-hand side. It does count backwards uh, for that. The different icons or the different utility tools that you can use, the magnifications. Magnification is, again, best for a math chart or graph. It is not large font. 
If a student needs large font, the Tave Online system is programmed to expand automatically to the device it's connected to. So if you have a student that needs a large font accommodation, you would not give them a small Chromebook. You would give them a traditional computer monitor, maybe a 19 or 21 or whatever size monitor, and it will fill that full screen, uh, increasing the, the font size automatically. The magnification within the test is just for that specific question, just to open up and make it a little bit bigger. As I mentioned, the calculator might be there for students to use, and it would have the calculator icon. Uh, and we talked about the color and the fonts, the contrasting. You can also mask under the options tab. You can hide parts of the screen. Students that really like to focus in, these two sides of the screen are the same passage. The student has just covered up a lot of the uh, directional pieces and part of the passage already. So you can mask whatever you need to really focus in if you have you know, a need to be more focused on that question. Text-to-speech is a, is, a, is a utility that can be activated for students and have that as an accommodation. It would turn on a utility bar at the bottom of the screen and also turns on a floating volume um, utility box that can be dragged out of the way. And then you'll notice that the blue or turquoise shading follows the word that's being read. So they can speed up or increase the volume of the reading, but uh, it is, once it's activated as an accommodation, it's driven by the student. For offline testing, so everything we've talked about is for online testing. Offline testing is an option that we started with Texas Corrections, and, and they were using paper-based testing with scanning and, and switching to offline testing. They've seen a reduction of 97% in the staff administrative time associated with testing. So they no longer have to manage inventory and track test booklets and answer sheets and, and all that process. They have much more time back for more teaching activities within the De Department of Corrections across all the facilities, the 97 sites in, in Texas. The difference with TAVE Offline is that it is a digital version of the paper test booklet. So it looks a little bit different from the student's perspective than TAVE Online. This, they see a digital version of the test booklet and they see an active answer sheet. This offline model is driven through a laptop from the administrator. The administrator is connected to the internet in an administrative area initially to set up the offline on their laptop and then they can go offline whether it's in a correctional setting, whether it's in a rural area that doesn't have a strong internet connection, and then they can register students offline, they can deliver the test offline in a computer lab that might have a local area network. And then after they're done, they take their laptop back to a, an area that has an internet connection and they upload the responses into our portal for scoring. So if you do have a need for offline, the resource center or our support center can help you get set up with that because that is included in the Arkansas contract. So again, if you have access to a computer lab that is not connected to the internet, you can do offline testing on that computer lab. Moving over after testing is done, we have many different reports that we can pull up. And I'm gonna look at some of the reports and go into some of the detail. Reports are under the report delivery heading and we either have on-demand reports or we have extract reports. Uh, the extract is really taking your data out in an Excel format. So if you want to sort your data a certain way in Excel, that's the on-demand extract. The on-demand reports is the, the majority of the reports that you will run. And we'll look at those a little bit later a sample of those. The on-demand roster, that is a report based on the test session. So some people would call that a class report or a teacher report, but we don't have the details of, of what class it is or what teacher it is. We have, it's this session. So it was our September intake session. If I want to run a report for everybody that's in that September intake, 
Again, we use the auto locator. So some students might take level D, some students might take level M. The roster report will show a summary of all the students that are in that test session. In the on-demand area of the reports, you have access to the individual profile and portfolio and locator reports. Those are the three areas on the on-demand reports. And looking at the individual, uh, to pull up those reports, you would have your site selected and then you select the report that you're going to run. So profile or portfolio. A profile is the detailed look of one testing occurrence. The portfolio is a summary of all tests by a single student. So if a student tested in January, July, and October, the portfolio will show you a summary of all three of those. The profile will show you the detail of one of those. So we can go ahead and go in and search for a student and we can pull up, we see a list of students at the bottom and we can select that student and then the PDF icon out on the right hand side lets us pull up that report. On a sample report for TABE, this is the most popular one, the individual profile. We see at the very top above the blue shading, we have the student's name. Below the blue shading is where they tested. In the first shaded area, gray shaded area, they have the day they tested and what tests they took. So reading level E, what my scale score is, what my NRS level is, and did I provide a measurable skills gain based on my results? So did this NRS level go up? One word of caution is that this NRS indicator for measurable skills gain only goes back to the previous July. So in this case, the student tested at the end of the June, it's looking back to the previous July to say, did they have another reading test? And is this score of three an improvement? And it says no. So this could have been a pretest and, and there is no other previous test or they did previously take a test and they still had the NRS level three for that. Down below, we have some uh, information about if you see a plus sign or minus sign, I'll come back to that in a minute. And then at the very bottom, we see the details from the blueprints that we saw earlier in the webinar. So under the tape blueprints for level E, reading foundational skills, key ideas and details, craft and structure, integration of knowledge and ideas are the areas that are being covered on level E reading. How many questions there are is in the first column. How many points there are. So now I know where those two point questions are. And there we see that there's one in key ideas, there's one in craft and structure, and there's two in integration of knowledge and ideas. So now I have an idea of where those two point questions are coming from. As a teacher, I can use that maybe in my instructional plan going forward. This student did did partially proficient in, in most of the areas, and they have full proficiency in craft and structure. The second page of the report now shows us, again, the left-hand side from the blueprint, the reading foundational skills, key ideas, and details, but it also tells us our demonstrated skills in our areas of next focus. These are our strengths and our weaknesses. We do want to watch out on the performance category, because when we get down to that one that says performance is, or the proficiency is full proficiency, technically I don't have any weaknesses. I did very well on that section, but I did very well at level E of the test. So my areas of next focus are level M skills. So just as a word of caution, if you ever see the word proficiency, be aware that the areas of next focus are projecting up to the next level of TABE. If I'm partially proficient or not proficient, my areas of next focus are always based on what I got wrong on the test. But since I did very well on craft and structure, now it's projecting up to the next level. Looking at our scores and our score ranges, TABE's scale runs from 300 to 800. And I'm going to jump to the live report of this by clicking on the link on this slide. 
And this is on our tapetest.com under the resource tab. There's a scoring best practice. And I'll make this a little bit bigger so it's a little easier to see. But we can see I'm going to use 536 as the example. I can get a 536 on reading in level M, level D, and level A. A 536 on level M means I did very well on the test. I'm at NRS level four. On level D, it means I did marginally well because I'm still at NRS level four, but the test increases to cover NRS level five. And on level A, a 536 is a poor score. It's almost out of range. It's still an NRS level four, but there's much more content above that. So again, knowing what content level the test is at is important as well as what the score is. So a 536 is, is an NRS level four, but my performance related to the content on the test will position me a little bit differently. A student that gets a 501 on level D is almost out of range. They will have a minus sign next to them. And I'll show that at the bottom of the screen here as an example. So we have a 501 on, on reading for level D and that gets me that minus sign. That minus sign is just a quick indicator for teachers to say, hey, that score was almost out of range. That student is probably gonna benefit from every teaching technique you have they are not a fast track student because in order to make a gain, they have to go to from 501 to 536. That's a bigger jump than somebody that may have scored a 530 on the level D test. That student that got a 530 only has a short little jump to make and, and maybe is a fast track student. Maybe you can go through the report, see the one area that they had a deficiency in, work on that area and be able to improve their scores. But a, a student with a 501 minus is just a quick indicator for that. On the same side, looking at math, a 656, that's the highest possible score on NRS level five. So down on our chart below, we see the student got a 656 plus. The plus sign is again, just an, a quick indicator to alert you that, hey, if I'm registering that student for a post-test, they need to move up to, Tabe level A because there's no growth possible on level D. They've, they've already achieved the highest possible score. So a minus sign means for a teacher that that student is going to benefit from all the help they can give. A plus sign on a score means that they need to move up. Now, a plus sign on a pretest means that I need to also move up on my instructional plan because the next test I'm gonna be taking is a level A test that's gonna cover higher level content. So I need to be enrolled in a higher level class to prepare for that. So again, another good indicator for teachers or, or administrators on where that student should be placed in what type of program. As I mentioned, the individual portfolio now shows just a summary. So again, we still, and this says last name, first name as a, as a dummy student, but we have the testing occurrences, January, December, and November for this uh, fictitious student that has just the summary of scores. So if you need a summary, that's the portfolio for you. We talked about that on-demand roster report. If you want to pull up that on-demand roster report, you need to know the test session name because when you go into the roster, that's what it's going to be based, based on is all the test session names are on the left-hand side. And when you open that up, here we see that our two students, Michael and Andrew, were the two students in that test session. And it looks very similar to the portfolio report because I just get a summary of their scores. But it tells me, you know, maybe they have the same level, maybe they were different levels, depending on if they were using the automatic locator or not. And then if you do do a standalone locator, you can pull up a locator report. So Dylan at the bottom of the screen took the reading locator, had 19 correct, the system is recommending level A. So again, this student did very well on all sections of the locator and the system would place them in level A. And you can concur with that and go ahead and manually register the student for level A. 
if they were in the auto locator, it would have registered for the automatically for level A. The last one is that on-demand extract. Once you select your site for the on-demand extract, you can select your date range. Do you want to look at today's date, yesterday, this week, this month, all of your data, or a specific date range? When you do select that, then you can go ahead and generate the report. And it, it just has all the data that we saw on the reports, but in an Excel format. So we see first name, last name, date of birth, gender, the date that person tested, what test they took, what their scores were. It goes all the way out to mode right now. The report that we send to LASIS or to Essential Education includes more detail. It includes everything on page two of the report. And we're working on adding that to this on-demand extract. But right now, that's only in the nightly file that we use to uh, share with our data partners and educational partners. We talked a little bit about remote testing, so I won't go too far into that. Just to know that we do have a lot of guidelines on tapetest.com, right on the main page, we have all the guidelines posted. There are guidelines for administrators or examiners and for students. You can share the student instructions directly with them. It walks through step-by-step step what they're gonna have to do on the day of testing. So if you wanna give them the booklet to do that, you can share that PDF with the students. The examiner guideline is what the, the test proctors will use to walk through that process. We also have a, a number of test taking tips and, and standardization practices uh, that are within the examiner guidelines. And we talked about the device check system as well. On tabetest.com, I'm gonna go back there real quick under the resource section, there is a tab for remote proctoring. We put all of the remote proctoring information together in one flyer and they're active links you see the examiner guides, the student guides. If you wanna know what Proctor U is a little bit more, there's a video for that. Um, the device check is at the bottom. The FAQ is there. So we have all that information. Test monitoring, a video about that. So a lot of emails, uh, a lot of information about remote proctoring is available on tabetest.com. Oops, got back. Let me jump ahead. Sorry about that. And again, I mentioned the FAQs. The biggest thing about remote proctoring, if you haven't done it and you have a need for students that can't come in or don't want to come in and you want to offer remote services, is that you have to practice because you as a test administrator are also now the live proctor. So you're using the portal at the same time that you're using your WebEx or your Zoom or your team. So you have to be proficient in both of them and, and practicing with some staff first is the, the best uh, recommendation that we have. This is an older slide. We have increased our, our guidelines that you can test up to 15 students at a, a time. So. Again, if you do have a webinar system that you have access to, you can test up to 15 students. Part of the research that we talked about was our high school equivalency when we talked about aligning to other resources and aligning to AccuPlacer or WorkKeys or our research projects that we wanna do, but we have completed the high school equivalency alignment. And that alignment allows us to have guidelines for recommended testing for high school equivalency. So we had students take TABE and then take the high school equivalency test within a, a relatively short amount of time. And what it showed was um, for reading and that a student that gets a 536 on TABE level M or above has a strong likelihood of passing the high school equivalency test at the minimum requirements. So for the GED, that's the 145. Now, if a student was to stay in adult ed and uh, continue with classes and take a TABE test level D or above and get a 627 on reading, then they are more likely to pass the GD at the college ready score. That's that 165. So again, this research will show you know, the different scores. Now, if you recall, 536 on level M of reading is the start of NRS level four. 
NRS level four is, is not the end of the process. NRS level six is. So could I take an average eighth grader out of the public school system and expect them to maybe pass the high school equivalency test at a minimum threshold? I think, I think that's a possibility. Again, passing at a 145 means I'm getting through high school with C's and D's. And so could a could an eighth or ninth grader in theory pass the high school equivalency test? Yes. Are they ready to leave high school? Are they ready to succeed at the next step, whether that's a job or post-secondary? Most likely no. Now there will be some students that could do that, but generally you're better prepared if you had a higher high school equivalency score. Certainly, if you took level A and got that 721 on tape, you're you know, predicted to get to that college ready plus credit score and have that 175 and be well prepared for post-secondary or, or workforce program. So again, students want to get their GED and that's a great accomplishment, but just getting the 145 may not mean that they're set up for success. And so, you know, using this as a guideline Maybe they don't have to get to the 165. Maybe they're getting somewhere between 145 and 165, but we're saying they have a better chance of get to that college ready if they go beyond. And, and, and I, I truly understand that retention is a very hard uh, topic to work with with students, but just this is some of the data. For math, it's the 537, which is also the start of NRS level four. So again, Level M or above, if you get a 537, you have a strong likelihood of passing the math test. So we have that data that's available. This is on the website too, under the resource tab, you'll see the high school equivalency concordance under the resource tab. The last thing we're gonna talk about today is, is a new research project that's getting ready to launch in a new uh, section for TABE, which is our workforce portal. Again, we've talked a little bit about this on some of our national webinars and we'll have some more dedicated ones a little bit later this fall when it becomes active. But we're aligning TABE to the reading and math requirements of over 700 jobs that are um, published by the U.S. Department of Labor's ONET website. We're doing that in a partnership with Metametrics and they're the research company that created reading lexiles and math quantiles, which are reading measures and math measures. Lexiles and quantiles measure a student's reading ability, but also measures the, the reading content that they're, they're being exposed to. So most library books are lexiled. Most K-12 textbooks are lexiled. Many states that do state testing on the spring and the fall provide lexile scores for the K-12 students. So if you're a parent and you've seen this, those state tests, um, I applaud you if you've noticed the Lexile score. It took me probably till my third kid to realize what was on the report and that uh, my kids had a Lexile score and I kind of knew what it was and I, I wasn't sure what I was looking at. But um, Lexiles measure a student's reading ability, but also measure the readability of content. And that's it's helpful because you may have students that are advanced readers or readers that need help and they are not necessarily fifth grade readers or eighth grade readers. Why this is important for TABE is that since Metametrics has aligned the reading and math requirements of these 700 jobs, now we can tell students that are interested in these jobs what TABE score you need to be successful in that job because here's the reading that you're gonna be required to do or the math that is required on that job. As a side output of this, Lexiles and quantiles are also normed on an annual basis by Metametrics, so we know annually what eighth graders are doing at a Lexile and quantile level, what 12th graders are doing. So it's going to allow us, and we're doing this currently, we're very close to publishing this white paper that will have new grade ranges for TABE based on these Lexile alignments. If we looked at the NRS levels from the Department of Education, there are six NRS levels. Those six NRS levels address 12 grade ranges. That could be a very easy division, you know, six into 12. But what it doesn't account for is that the increase in rigor of the standards really incorporates AP classes and AP content. So you're really not looking at 12 grades, you're really looking at 14 grades because 
that AP content that they're looking for success. Same thing that the GED is looking at with the GED plus college credit, you're, you're functioning above the 12th grade range. So with these Lexiles, we will be able to have a more detailed look. Um, you know, I, I do know that 12th grade reading just from the initial data is somewhere in the high level D range. It's, it's not, you don't have to get to level A to be reading at the 12th grade um, based on normative data. Uh, again, a little bit different. And so now we're gonna look at what the actual data shows versus what the plan is for some of the content. So we'll have a, a, a new white paper being published shortly that will help programs and states and workforce programs understand TABE scores as it relates to grade ranges in, in an actual performance world. Our new workforce portal will be driven by you as administrators. You'll be able to go into the portal and access data for the student. It's not student driven at this point. There's been some talk about the designing it for a student, but right now a counselor, a teacher, an administrator would go into the TAPE portal, go into the workforce area once it launches, enter the student's information, and then, or pull up a list of students and find the students that you want to work with. So are you working with a group of students or just one student? And then select, the career area that you're interested in. So within the Department of Labor, there are 16 career clusters. Every job in the country is classified in one of those 16 career clusters. So they each have hundreds and thousands of jobs. Under architecture and construction, one of the jobs is electrical power line installer. That job generally needs a high school um, graduate level education for that job. And then there's some preferred experience based on the job descriptions that are posted for that job like title. What we have done is now compared metametrics, and this chart is a little off because it's still in development. They're just re really working on the look and feel of the chart, not the numbers yet. But it's going to say the gray chart, the gray side, well, here's the reading requirement for electrical power line installer, and here's your tape score. Are you at or above the expectation of the reading ability for that job. Same thing with your math. Is Your math is going to be the purple score. The, the job is going to be the gray score. And is your score above or below the target range for that job? So now you'll be able to show a student, yes, you want to go into electrical power line installing. Your math is very good. Your reading you know, might be marginal or below. So we want to work on your reading a little bit more because you're going to be reading some very technical manuals to do some of that work. And so you need to have advanced reading skills to be successful in that job. You can also sort that file by the Lexile and Quantile instead of the TABE score. So if you are going, you know, some programs are using Lexiles and Quantiles, they are more the K-12 based programs or the ones that are tied into school districts. But if you have resources that are aligned to Lexiles and Quantiles, we'll provide that information as well. So. You might look for a technical manual that has already been lexiled and is at the readability range of that student if you're doing a CTE program or an IET program potentially. That job as electrical power line installer has some key tasks. Up in the top left corner, we can see adhere to safety practices and procedures. That's a pretty common task for a lot of different jobs. And so we pull from the Department of Labor other jobs that have similar tasks because that student might realize that an electrical power line installer has to climb a hundred foot power pole and they have a fear of heights. So now they wanna use some of the skills that they have and look at other jobs that might be applicable for that. So we'll provide a list of other jobs as well. We've been looking at jobs that a student was interested in. So we started with electrical power line installer. We could go the other way, and I don't have a screenshot of that yet because it's still in development, but we could say your TAPE score is 580 in reading and, and 68 or 560 in math. What are the careers that are around that TAPE score range? And it could pull up a list of careers that the student could then uh, look at and investigate a little bit more into certain careers. So you'll be able to search for the student into a specific career based on their TAPE score, 
or look at their tape score and find a list of careers that might be applicable to them based on their current skill level. We also pull into the portal the information from the Department of Labor on salary and growth. So this job of electrical power line installer, we see the map, the map is shaded. Darker states have higher demand. So we see in the middle of the country, a little bit higher demand on the southern border, not so much. So depending on where this student might be, you know, they can see that, you know, on, on a national basis, a 2% growth, we could then zoom into a zip code to see what that growth is locally versus nationally as well. Phase two of this portal, which won't be available this fall, probably be early next year, is to include a growth planner and then linkings to educational resources. The growth planner is pretty self-explanatory. You know, we're we're saying you're you're here on the on the bar chart and you want to go to a certain target, and we can set that up. The linking to the educational partners is a little bit more challenging because we don't know what accounts you have with Aztec or Essential Ed or New Research Press or uh, KET. Uh, we just put those there because we know they have digital resources. Um, so we're still working on how to either launch that curriculum if you have those accounts or to at least direct you to a table of contents for that curriculum. The other resource that we're also looking at is if you've heard of Crowded Learning, Crowded Learning is a, a not-for-profit group part of World Education and they align TAVE and College and Career Readiness objectives to free resources. So you can go to crowdedlearning.org and pull up free resources that are aligned to TAVE and to the College and Career Readiness sources. So it might be that it's better for us to link to those resources as more of an open source. And so we're, we're working on how to build out this growth planner and educational cross-reference uh, for phase two that will come out early next year. So again, this workforce portal uh, is available later this fall. Um, we will work with the state and with the resource center if, if they desire to add it to the TAME account and we'll make you know more information available as that happens. I just wanna quickly review the resources that we've gone over today. And we've talked about the documentation on our portal. That's the more secure information. And then the information that's on tabetest.com, that's the more public. So the blueprints, the online tools training, the sample items, the formula sheets, all of those are on the public website. The more scoring guides and test directions are all under the portal itself. And then I also want to point out our support team. You have free access to our support team. I mentioned that earlier, 866-282-2250. You can always call them with any TABE online question, any TABE scanning question, and you can go through that. And then my information, I'm happy to share these slides. Again, this session is being recorded. So the Resource Center will make it available after we're done. I will also give the slides to the Resource Center so they can post them as well. Uh, but if you have any additional questions after we're done today, um, I'm happy to answer those. I'll double check in the chat here. I don't see any uh, new questions popping up yet. Um, so again, if you have a question, I'm happy to answer it in the chat if you, if you post it there. If we don't get to it today, you can always send me an email to uh, my email that's on the screen and we can address that or you can always contact the support of the resource team and they they know how to get a hold of me as well very easily so i will stop there and thank everybody and again if you have any questions you can continue to put them in the chat i'll keep it open for a little bit but uh thank you again for your time and i uh, hope you have a good rest of the week and just as a reminder we do have the the similar training tomorrow for tape classy on the esl side at the same time Right. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate you.